Welcome to the uh, February uh, program of the Dr. Harold C. Deutsch World War II History Roundtable, our 32nd year, and uh, I, uh, I, I'm always glad to see you folks here. I want to recognize our World War II veterans in the audience. I know there's one right here. Stand up, Mr. Mr. CB. Any others? Great, great. Thank, thanks for coming out. Moving on to, uh, to this evening's program, uh, several of you may remember we had a young lady come out a few years ago by the name of Sharon Tosi Lacey. And she said, she's my husband's a great historian. <laughs> so anyway, um, we've stayed in touch with Sharon and with Jim. And we, uh, we, we drug him out of the swamp in D.C. to uh, a snowstorm here in Minnesota. So I'm not sure which is worse, huh? But uh, Jim uh, is a New Yorker. Uh, he um, uh, graduated from the Citadel, served a bunch of time in the 82nd, 101st Airborne. His, um, uh, he has a notable experience in his life that many of you will always remember. His office was on the 84th floor of one of the towers at the World Trade Center. He happened to be in the lobby on 9-11 walked out and saw the planes hit one of the towers and uh, he lost many of his uh, co-workers on that day. So uh, I, I think uh, many of us will always remember 9-11 as, as a day that we remember uh, where we were. So Jim, welcome to Minnesota. Uh, let's talk about how this, uh, the political and the chaos in Washington in World War II uh, got us through the war. Thanks. I tried many ways of public speaking. So my last couple of times, I just read my notes. I looked up once in a while, like it says to do in the books, and it, it was miserable. And uh, I think I'm better in a classroom environment where I walk around a lot, but they told me I can't walk because that's like a black hole And when you film in this thing. So... Uh, what I was gonna do is put slides up and I made a couple of notes for each slide. I'm just gonna talk about them. And I thought that would work and then that gentleman way back there in the back told me this was a really smart group and they expected a lot and their questions would probably dumbfound me. Your questions would probably dumbfound me. So he piled a ton of pressure on me. I was thinking of walking out the door. Didn't have a ride and it was really cold. Mostly I remembered I'll never see any of you again and who cares if I flop. Except for Marie here, who's been a rock in my life these past 20 years, emotional anchor. Um, all right, we're going to start with the beginning. World War II, <coughs> Roosevelt is a weakened president in the run-up to World War II, mostly because of his own making. Uh, in 1936 election, he thought he had carte blanche to do anything. It was an overwhelming Democratic victory, and he was going to use this to make sure things happen. The New Deal, all his great ideas were squashed, or what he thought were great ideas, were all squashed by the Supreme Court. A good many of them were squashed by the Supreme Court. So he decided to pack the Supreme Court with people that he liked better, raise their numbers up to 12, give each judge over the age of 70 an assistant judge to help him out and vote, all sorts of things. They were great ideas. He briefed the Democrats. I'm putting this forward tomorrow, and I hope you love it. Well, they did not love it. They hated it. And the, the, the head of the Senate on the drive back, he's got four of his senators. Boys, this is where I cash in my chips. I'm done. But Roosevelt decided to fight it out anyway, and he got this gentleman here, Senator Joe Scrappy Robinson, to be his floor manager. He's going to push this thing through to, through to sent Congress and the Senate, and Joe was going to make it happen. Well, Joe didn't even believe in it, but he, he, he was going to support his president, and he fought hard for it, so hard that it killed him. And they said, hey, you know, this guy died in the saddle fighting for you, Mr. President, 
And the president was so upset that he had, was not winning on this that he refused to go to Joe's funeral. Senators have elephantine memories for these kind of things, which they consider a personal insult. Uh, they voted overwhelmingly against the packing deal. The vice president of the United States comes in, the man who coined that famous phrase, the vice president he isn't worth a bucket of spit, is how you usually hear it. That's not the word he used. <laughs> so you don't have the votes, Captain. Give it up. And the president finally gave it up. Enter Bernard Baruch. Anyone heard of him? Baruch College, famous, self-made, multi-millionaire many times over, big supporter of the Democratic Party. He's the one who eventually talked the president out of continuing this fight. The president was willing to continue it. The vice president said, don't. Bernard Baruch called him up. Please, Mr. President, I'm begging you, stop killing senators and hung up the phone, the president decided to call it off. I just thrown his name up there for something you should remember. He, in World War I, he was in charge of all of the production effort. Did a pretty good job, considering a zero start and four million men mobilized later, and most of them got fed every day. They got clothed. It was a, he did a tremendous job in a very hard position, and he expected a repeat for World War II that he'd be called upon. The call really never came. Came a little late, but then it was taken away, but it never came early, and he got, he was hurt, you know? It's like, I'll be hurt if I see anybody walking out the door before I'm finished. Very hurtful. Uh, he made it a habit. He was always there to advise. He got some advisory roles of just sitting on a park bench outside the White House, waiting for people to come and ask him for advice. And they did. It became like a, a totem out there. Every, every other day or every third day, He'd go and sit on a park bench, feed the pigeons, and, get, and dispense advice to people who wanted to know how to mobilize the U.S. government for war, because he was the only one who ever did it. And I'm just throwing him up there because it's, you know, we're going to talk, he'll, he'll pop up into the scene later on. Roosevelt, instead of licking his wounds and going back and trying new things, blamed his own party for wrecking his court packing scheme. And he was right, it was his party that killed it. The Republicans, doing a very smart thing, I don't know that they do this all the time, said, don't, don't, don't get in the way of your enemy when they're making a mistake. Throughout the entire court packing arguments, just stayed, in the, stayed low, said nothing, did nothing, and watched the Democratic Party rip itself apart. And the president doubled down on this. He went after every senator and congressman that was fighting against his proposal and tried to get them overturned in the, in the uh, primaries coming up to the next congressional elections. Enter Jimmy Burns. Anyone heard of him? Yeah. There's a lot of no's in there. Some people know him as, a state as the Secretary of State during the Truman administration. Um, in World War II, he's, at the, towards the end of World War II, he is the most powerful man in the United States. Right next to the president, of the United president himself, he is the most powerful man in the in the in the United States, and most people don't even know his name. But at this time, Jimmy, as everyone called him, was a senator. He's Mr. Fixer. You needed something in the Senate, you go to Jimmy Burns. Jimmy Burns, president. He got most of the president's legislation that got through the White House, got through the Senate for confirm, um, for the president to sign. Was Jimmy Burns did that? He, he, he was just a master of the Senate. Before, before you, know, you get that term with Lyndon Johnson, master of the Senate, this is the first one. Very powerful man, very easy to get along with. Somebody said, you go into an office to fight it out in front of Jimmy. Uh, you might believe two and two is four. I'll say two and two is six. We leave the office convinced the answer is five. <laughs> He's also a brutal political infighter. When, uh, the, sm the smile Jimmy Burns greeted you with always had a, was a dagger behind his back for any enemy that, that uh, dared show himself. But he went to the president and said, call this off, Mr. President. And the president said, uh, no, nope, I'm going to do it. Went to Baruch. I'm going to fight the president on this. I need a few million dollars. 
Baruch said, Jimmy, sure, I'll give you anything you want. And Baruch said, oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Baruch. You've always been a gentleman. You're a good man. I'm going to take these millions, and we're going to kick the president's ass. And they did. The president spent an entire year, incredible amounts of political capital, fighting against his own party. And it was all over. Hmm. I lost one. <laughs> when it was all over, the, uh, he, he managed to get one congressman defeated in the primaries. Everybody else went through using Senator Jimmy Byrne's political power and Baruch's money. And it was another total defeat for the president. <clears throat> The president <clears throat> was a really nice guy at heart, or seems to have been, as much as you could tell about him. Uh, but he never got close to anybody. As, uh, as his wife said, a lot of people thought they were indispensable to the president right up to the day they weren't. And then they, <laughs> and then they would just disappear. But he never liked firing somebody. So he always got someone else to fire him, and he wanted them taken care of if they were loyal to him. But if he had any sense of disloyalty, he became the most brutal person one can imagine. Wreck their lives, go after the kids, go to the third generation, wreck all their lives too. He was just that kind of man. But in this case, he could not afford to lose Baruch, who finances a good part of the Democratic Party. The Democratic Convention for the last, for, it was financed by Baruch and Jesse Jones, who we'll hear about in a little bit. And he can't afford to offend Jimmy Burns, who is still Mr. Fixit on the Senate floor. If he loses Jimmy Burns political support, he gets nothing done the rest of his presidency. So he goes and he forgives and he forgets. Well, he forgives anyway. But now we're up to 1939, where the war is on the horizon, and the president can see it. Make no mistake, there's a lot of people who don't think there's going to be a European war, including many in Congress and the Senate, and there is a lot of People who do think there's going to be one, but America could stay out of it. The president from 38 on knows there's going to be a war, and he knows the Americans can't stay out of it. But he's got to move really slow. He can't get rid of the neutrality acts. He can't move the Congress or the Senate because he's politically crippled. These fights have taken almost everything out of the president in terms of political power, have taken everything out of him, and he's got to move slow. But he starts to build a team of all outers, and that's what they call, were called then, that's what they called themselves. These are the guys who supported an all-out effort right now to mobilize American military, mobilize American industry, mobilize American power, and get, get it ready for the fight. And later on, they started pushing the president to get into the fight. And the president was always ready to listen, he knew, but he was going by inches. He never wanted to get out of public opinion. Even when public opinion showed 70% or higher support for London, he would still hold back a little bit, because, or a lot in many cases, because uh, he thought it was shallow. So a lot of things people support until an American ship gets blown up, and then they say, oh, well, 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 didn't expect that. He was waiting for that event. Pearl Harbor gave it to him that united everybody and put them in for the death. But he still needed to do something. And the first thing he started doing was building a team of all outers around him. And the first and most powerful of these is Harry Hopkins. Harry Hopkins is a social worker. He got the new president in, the, in New York. Um, brings him to Washington, puts him, in front of, puts him in front of one of the two biggest agencies for helping uh, people, where he proves that there's one thing Harry Hopkins can do is spend money at an incredible rate of speed. <laughs> Government money. Any money he got, he pushed it out the door. And he's like, you know, this is bad in the long term. He goes, people don't, people don't eat in the long term. People eat today. You know, uh, this, how, many, you know how much money do you want to push out? All you got, then give me more. Um, he was very good at it. He didn't care if he got any of it back. This leads to a, oh, I'll have to get to this. Now, besides that, he's a very sickly man. He's got some severe of his stomach, intestines, probably some type of cancer. But most of his stomach has been removed. He's got to be on serious diets throughout the entire war. Uh, he's also a lousy husband, lousy father, committed socialist. There is nothing redeemable about Harry Hopkins' character, as far as I can see. He hated the rich, but he loved to pal around with them. 
They paid all of his gambling debts, which were pretty huge. I mean, he was, as far as I could tell in the research, he would, he would gamble $1,000 at the, at the races in a single weekend. And $1,000 during the Great Depression, we're talking some serious, serious money. And then not pay when his wife he finally had to leave him because of his bad behavior. Uh, he, he never paid a child support the entire time. Um, so, you know, he's just not a nice guy. But he's an incredible administrator, and the president loved having him around because he tells the best stories. He, and, and, and as somebody said, a lot of people hang around the president. Harry Hopkins is the only one who doesn't bore him. And Harry knew when to pull back, tell him a story, when to press forward and push for a decision. The other thing about Harry Hopkins, he was sick. He couldn't be president of the United States himself. A lot of powerful people around the president wanted to be president. And Harry didn't. And later, Wendell Wilkie comes in after the next election and says, why do you have this guy around you? He's poison. He goes, Wendell, someday you may be in this office, and you're going to want a guy who has nothing, no ambition except to make what you want happen, happen. And that's, that's, what, that's what he is. Now, he finally loses his power. His main power is he lives in the White House. He gets out of Mayo Clinic. He comes to the White House for a dinner. He's feeling sickly. The president says, why don't you stay over for the night? That's an in. He never leaves. The guest that came to dinner <laughs> times a 1,000 here. <laughs> so every morning, he meets the president. The president goes to bed. That's the guy he's talking to. And then he made that cardinal mistake. He ma got married, and his wife eventually made him leave the White House. And he wasn't there every single day to talk to the president, get, figure out what the president wanted, and then make it happen. But for the first, at this period, in the first couple of years, he is. He's got one tremendous enemy, and that's the guy standing to his left in the picture, Harold Ickes. And we're going to come to him in a minute. But uh, remember, he could spend money. He's an incredible administrator, and he knows what the president wants, and he knows how to give it to him. The other guy he brought in, oh, got a little quote there. One of his famous quotes is, um, we're going to spend, 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 elect, elect, elect. Something all the parties figured out after that. <laughs> this is an example. Harry Hick Harold Hickey's, or as he was known in Washington at the time, as horrible Harold. He called himself a curmudgeon, which is being kind. Uh, <laughs> had the other major relief agency, all the alphabet agencies, I'm not going to go through their names, and went to the president and said, I, you shouldn't give that to Harry, that's my bailiwick. So they made a decision that Harry could only spend on projects that cost $25,000 or less. And anything more than that went to Harold, horrible Harold there, because he, only, he wanted to build dams and big stuff, stuff that made brought a profit later on, and he, did, you know, he, didn't, he cared about getting the money back for the people on the government and making these things that last. And, the, and as you know, Harry just wanted to get money, pay paychecks in people's pocket. They're both right. But Harry, you know, Harry comes back to his office. They're all dejected. Oh, look, we can't do big projects anymore. He said, no, take all those multi-million dollar projects and chop them up into $24,000 little projects and throw that money out the door. <laughs> Gotta love Harry. Anyway, next guy in the ping, anyone recognize him? Secretary of Treasury Morgenthau. Uh, what can we say about him? Failed at business, failed pharma, um, lived next door to the president basically, got along with the president very well, sharply committed to the Allied cause, very committed, <coughs> and very committed to giving Roosevelt anything he wanted. So at this point and throughout the rest of the war, Anytime any of the cabinet department said, I don't want to do anything, the president stripped that away from that cabinet department and put it in treasury so ha uh, Harry and Morgenthau can do it. Um, when Truman comes president, he looks and goes, what, what's your responsibilities? He gets a list. He goes, no, 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 back in your box. And Harry's removed, and, and uh, the then the treasury becomes one of the lesser departments where it's remained since then. But at this point, the Department of Defense is being led by a pacifist, who doesn't want to build planes? So the president says, Harry, you build planes. The Treasury's on it, sir. We'll go, we're going to build those factories today. Give the money to uh, 
Harry Hopkins over there. He'll build it through his, his um, relief agencies. And Harry's like, I'm on it, Mr. President. You know, we'll break it into $24,000 segments. We'll have 10 factories up by the end of the year. All of it totally illegal. Uh, but it's getting done. And we're building these war industries at a rapid rate of speed behind the scenes because no one's talking about it to the press. They're, they're, they are building... They are building factories in the, you know, for airplane production. Nothing else but airplane production. And uh, um, I, guess, I guess that's about enough about Morgan Fowler. Let's enter. He was, oh, he's a psycho, sycophant. Is that a good word? Sycophant. Yeah. I mean, if the president looked at him crosswise, he literally went back to his office and cried the rest of the day. He was useless. <coughs> All right. There he is. Horrible Harold. I wish, I wish I had time to read the description Time Magazine gave this guy in the book. If there's any dirty jobs that the White House needs done, Harold does it. <clears throat> He's a, he calls himself the old curmudgeon. He's Roosevelt's attack dog. Roosevelt wants, you to do, Roosevelt wants to attack somebody and doesn't want his fingerprints on it? Send horrible Harold out to do it. He did all the dirty work. He hated Harry Hopkins. I mean, hated him. That's, a, that's good old Harry there, smiling as usual. <laughs> they hate each other. <laughs> President took on board the USS Houston, which I heard about today in my conversations. I forget why, but it was, someone was talking about it. And the ship newspaper said that the president only brought them aboard so he could sneak up behind them and push them overboard together, <laughs> trying to get them to fish with them off the side of a cruiser and become pals. It didn't get anywhere. Icky's always wanted to be, not be Harry Hopkins, but do what Harry Hopkins did and have that kind of influence on the president, and he never got it. And he said, the only reason he listens to Harry is Harry lives there. If I lived there, the president would listen to me too. The president would be beating him to death with a stick if he lived with him. Uh, anyway, he resented Hopkins. They hated each other throughout the entire war. He's a thorn in Hopkins' side. Every time Hopkins wants to do something, there's Icky's. But they both had their purpose. And Icky's, in this part, is really important, especially in the election that's coming up and in fighting the, uh, the, the good fight to get America into the war and against America first, which we're going to talk about. And his influence wanes later. He, he, he becomes the oil czar, and he does good things, but he gets blamed for the rationing, which we really didn't need. We had plenty of oil in the United States, but we rationed it to save tires, save the rubber on the tires. So people didn't understand why we were rationing oil when there was so much of it. And he, gets, he got all the blame for that. And he put himself up as a czar of a couple other things. And uh, you know, when you're the czar of something and it's hard and it hurts people's lives, so it makes their lives a little harder, you become really unpopular. So he was getting that, all that unpopularity stuff. And uh, he wasn't in the White House every day. So he, his, his power wanes as Harry Hopkins grows. And then there was another all outer. Anyone ever heard of Grenville Clark? No. no, you did? Really, that's good. Grenville Clark is one of those people who operates behind the scenes, never gets his name in the newspaper, never wanted to be in the newspaper. In World War I, the Plattsburgh movement, heard of that, created uh, all the Plattsburgh schools, trained a whole bunch of people how to be officers. And almost every young officer we had in World War I was a member of the Plattsburgh movement. He started that. He knew Roosevelt when he was a lawyer in New York. He's, he was behind a lot of the New Deal stuff, said, how can we make this presentable to big business what, so they don't hate it so much they're trying to kill it in its infancy? He did a lot of that. If there's any one person that should be the icon of everyone who wants to be a behind-the-scenes power broker, Grenville is it. And that's how he would do it, sit away from the president and whisper into his ear. Yeah, what do you want there, Grenville? So... He decided, we need, Grenville decided we needed a draft. He came to Washington to sell it. He walks into the Pentagon. He can't get an appointment for the president for some reason because the president knows why he's there and the president doesn't want to fight out this draft thing. He walks into the Pentagon, into the, not the Pentagon, the war office. We didn't have a Pentagon yet. And he uh, finds the Secretary of War, whose name just went out of my head, I'm sorry, Woodring. Nope, not him yet. Woodring, learns he's a pacifist that doesn't want to mobilize anything for war. 
He's against it. He's against war. He's against anything that smacks of war. He said, well, I've got to get rid of this guy. Let me go down and talk to General Marshall. And he finds out Marshall's, Grenville's words, not mine, is an idiot. Marshall, he says, you need a draft. And Marshall says, no, I can fight with the army I have. You can't. <laughs> and he couldn't convince Marshall he needed a draft. Now, some people say, who've looked at this, said Marshall just didn't want to get ahead of the president. That was not Grenville's impression. He said, you're going to need an army that can fight Hitler in Europe. He goes, no, Hitler's coming to South America. And he gave him a 15-minute discourse on how the United States had to protect South America. And Grenville's like, no, that's 5,000 miles. The Nazis aren't coming to South America. And he walked out very disappointed in General Marshall. Um, that's OK. He can't do anything about Marshall. But he might be able to do something about the Secretary of War. So he goes to his buddy, Felix Frankfurter. Frankfurter is on the Supreme Court. But he's also an insider. He knows everybody. And he know, it, because he was a lawyer and he taught in the law schools, he knows lots of young people. And he's, he's, he's like a talent scout for the New Deal. He's putting his people in there, and they're all known as, uh, during the war, as Felix's happy little hot dogs. Uh, see that pun there, Frankfurt a hot dog? I should have to work this hard for a laugh, folks. <laughs> anyway, one of his guys, Dean Atchison, starts World War II all by himself. Now, I don't know how many people know this, but Dean Atchison was thrown out because he was against uh, the president setting the price for gold. The president would set the price for gold every morning. He'd wake up and they'd say, what's the price of gold this morning, Mr. President? And he would just give them a price. No, no reason for it. He would just move it up and down. He, he thought it was funny. And that would be the official price of gold for the day. And he wrote a paper saying that was illegal and immediately got fired. Trying to make nice, he wrote a big editorial in the New York Times about the transfer of submarines for bases to England and gave it a legal justification. So he was allowed back in where he got control of the oil spigots for uh, Japan. The president goes to the Atlantic Conference thinking he has told them to raise the pressure a little bit, cut off some of their oil so they do something. Well, when the president left, he cut off all their oil. The president did not know that we had a full oil embargo on Japan till 30 days after the Atlantic Conference when the oil embargo was 40 days old. He, Dean Atchison did it all by himself. The president thought we would look weak if we reversed it. And from the moment we had the oil embargo, as many of most of you should know or do know, Japan's on a timetable to war. All because of one of Felix's little happy hot dogs. Uh, he go, he's the one who says, who says, sits down with Grenville and says, we need a new secretary of war. Grenville says, we need a new secretary of war. Who can we get? And they go through several names, and they finally hit on Stimson. And while we're at it, let's get a new Secretary of Navy. Who should we get? Knox. You go over to the White House. Want to fire Woodring? Yes. Want to fire your current Secretary of Navy? Yes. Here's the two guys. The president looks at Republicans. Their, their convention's coming up. This would be great. Ah, if I could get the two stalwarts of the Republican Party. A man, I mean, these are the big names in the party. Both of them anti-Roosevelt, anti, uh, but pro all out. Pro getting into the war and start to mobilize. He says, would they be interested? And calls up. They, call, they go back. President's interested. Let's call Stimson. Stimson says, I got to check with the wife. Call you back tomorrow. Calls back. Wife says, hey, it's OK. You could do it as long as, I, as long as I can have Patterson, another lawyer. I'll come to him in a minute. Um, as my undersecretary. Says, fine. Goes back and forth. Suddenly, wood rings out. Stimson is in. We have a new secretary of war who's a full all-outer. He believes in heavy mobilization. Marshall suddenly sees the light. Good things are happening. Um, but America doesn't want to get into this war. There's an American first movement. And that's the face of it. <laughs> Let me go back on that. Uh, uh, we'll talk about that later. Uh, the face, the American first movement. It's millions and millions of people, all of them writing to the president, congressmen, senators, gigantic mass meetings in which Lindbergh is the top speaker. As you know, Lindbergh uh, spent a lot of time in Europe, spent a lot of time in Germany, got taken around to see German air bases, where he would see hundreds of German fighters, German bombers. He'd be going to the next base. They would take off from that base. All of them fly to the next base he was going to visit, so they were all there again the next day. 
So he was seeing this gig. They had a big air armada, but he was seeing an air armada much bigger. And he's writing back to the, to the war department. And anyone who listens, this German air armada is invincible. We can't win a war. Um, he's, I don't want to say he's a Nazi, but he likes what National Socialism has done to help Germany. Uh, his wife is a committed Nazi. A lot of historians have tried to rehabilitate her over the years. Read her book. She's committed. She loves Hitler. He makes the mistake of taking a medal from Goring himself before he comes home. Uh, he, he, and now he's, now, he's, now, he's in all, now he's fighting this tooth and nail. The president sends horrible Harold. Everywhere Lindbergh goes, you go to. Get on the radios, get on the TVs, call him names. I mean, this is a job only Horrible Harold can do. And uh, Horrible Harold does a pretty good job of it. I mean, people hear Lindbergh, and then they hear Har Horrible Harold calling a Nazi, Nazi supporter. And you got to remember what else is going on now. I, I just watched Mrs. Miniver last night. Hollywood is filled with people who want America in the, in the fighting or getting ready for the fight. So it, the, the story, the the the... The, uh, what's happening is um, slowly changing American minds. And you've got uh, the newscast, I'm sorry, his name went out of my head. Merrow, Merrow in, in London, you know, telling about the bombing every night and it's coming in on all the radios to 50 million homes nightly. It's, it's, it's slowly turning the tide, but it's still a long, hard fight. By the way, Lindbergh's mom was an all-outer. She, she almost disowned her son on, on many occasions during this thing. Did throw the wife out of the house when she realized she was a Nazi. Um, by early 1941, FDR got, was getting the ball rolling. He had enough public support that he could start to mobilize. He got rid of the neutrality acts. He got the draft passed. The draft is later extended by a single vote of rare, raw political power. You know, it's up there, it's, it's up by two votes, and then one vote changes his mind, and the cut speaker of the House says, voting is closed, there's an uproar. No, no, there's still 20 minutes left. Voting's closed, everyone go home before another person can change their mind, take the vote away. Uh, starts forming agencies, one after another, NADAC, SPAB, WPB. These are all the, al the alphabet agencies, as they call them, that were going to run the war. And the biggest, the most important of them is NADAC, later turned into SPAB. And you see these guys over and over again. Hillman is in charge of, he represents labor. He's a committed communist. Stentius is industry. And he later becomes Secretary of State. He's just a weak man. Lord O'Brien's the lawyer. Beaverbrook is from England. He's a press, um, he's a press baron, multimillionaire many times over sits at the right hand of Churchill, sort of like Harry Hopkins until he too falls out of favor. And these guys with Knudsen as their leader are trying to get American industry moving. Uh, Knudsen, a lot of these people get jobs because they're malleable. They're not strong men. They're successful men, but they're not strong men. Harry Hopkins is picking most of these people. And there's one thing Harry Hopkins will not tolerate, competition. If you were a strong personality who might confront him or go to the president and say something that Harry doesn't agree with, Harry's going to do everything he can to block you. And you see it throughout the entire war. So Knudsen is put in the job, and he proves really, really slow. He doesn't want to convert. You know, hey, depression's ending. GM is selling cars again. And he comes from GM, where he was making $300,000 salary a year. That's, that's in, throughout the Great Depression. So he's one of the richest men in the United States in terms of salary. He exchanges that for a dollar a year. Uh, he's a good dollar a year man. Most dollar a year men were bad people. You know, they get a good reputation now because, oh, look, they sacrificed. They came here and they worked only a dollar a year. No, they came here and they got paid by the government for a dollar. Four out of five of them were still being paid their full salary by their own companies, and they were expected to shuffle contracts back to their companies. Um, but he wasn't like that. When he left GM, nothing wrong with that, right? <laughs> Is that what you said? Lobbyists. It was obvious, yes. But they had positions of power where they could actually make this happen. They weren't just lobbyists. They were lobbyists lo lobbying themselves. Um, it's the American way, I guess, or it's become the American way. Uh, 
He does, but he doesn't want to cut. He's, he's cut all his ties to GM, but he feels for them. He doesn't want to start taking away their steal just as they are getting ready, you know, it's just as their production and they're going to make a profit for the first time in a decade. Here, here he is trying to take the punch ball away. So he's a very weak man. He, he's, he, he just won't make the hard decisions when it comes to reducing <coughs> what industry gets and turning it towards the war ethic. He does love to play bridge. And the man he plays bridge with the most is this guy, Jesse Jones. Anyone remember him? No, one guy. Great, that's what he has. In the Depression, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation has the big money. Every big project you want done, the money comes from Reconstruction Finance. So when Harold Bohiro and Harry Hopkins need serious money, they have to come to him. And he's very proud that he's never lost a dime. All of his projects have made money. Not only that, though he is a strong and stalwart Democrat and gave millions to the Democratic Party, he, when it comes to spending, he's nonpartisan. He'll finance stuff in a Republican district just as quickly as he'll finance it in a Democratic district. So Congress loves this guy. Senate loves this guy. He's a, he's, he spends money. He spends it on things in their districts. And he doesn't care what party you belong to as long as the project's not going to lose money. He's also biblically big. I don't think that picture gives you quite the size. He's about 6'6", six, six, 300 pounds. Self-made millionaire, many times over. Slow to anger, but in a violent temper once angered. He got a bad editorial in the, New York, in the Washington Post one day and saw the guy, the, the editor of the Washington Post, at dinner in a restaurant that night and beat him up. <laughs> What he did, though, was hire the best people available. I mean, really good finance people, really good traders, and they turned out to be all outers. So Secretary of War, Under Secretary of War Patterson would need a contract, a billion dollar contract to build a major factory to build tanks. He'd send it over to the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. That same day, they would send the contracts back to the, to the war office to be signed. If I say Pentagon, I mean war office. Um, literally spending a billion dollars at a time on 24, 12, not even 24, 12 to 16 hours notice. The thing would come in at 8 o'clock, contracts would be ready by noon, sent to the, sent to the Pentagon or the war office by 3, signed before close of business that day. And never tell their boss. He never did. He says, they're all plotting to take my money, but I'll never give it up. He eventually finds out, fires them all. They all found good jobs. They were highly qualified people. <coughs> but he's trapped now. He's, he's now financed most of the factories that are going up to produce war things. And those factories need financing for machine tools. They need financing to bring in people. They need financing for raw materials. And if he doesn't put up the next level of financing, he loses all the money from the first level. And Jesse Jones does not like to lose money. So he continues to finance the war effort out of Reconstruction Finance Corporation money. He is, in financial terms, the most powerful man in the United States of America throughout the mid-1930s and probably throughout the entire war. He's got one enemy in the world, we might mention later, Vice President Wallace after the election. Vice President Wallace wants to do all sorts of great things, you know, you know buy commodities, run, becomes like his own Secretary of State, gets into a big fight with the Secretary of State, Roosevelt doesn't have any time for this. He, he builds his own administrative department to buy commodities and do a whole bunch of other stuff that he thinks is helping the war. But Jesse Jones won't give him any money. Can't buy commodities if you don't have money. So he starts um, a fight that eventually, when Jesse Burns, that goes throughout the entire war, 43, 44, when Jesse Burns becomes all powerful, the first job on his thing is. Uh, Get, just get Jones and the vice president to stop fighting with each other. He calls them both into his office. They both come because he is the most powerful man in the world at the moment next to the president of the United States himself. And he has to stop them from fist fighting in his office, the vice president and the head of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and the Commerce Department. He rolls, he becomes the Secretary of Commerce and he rolls RFC into it. He doesn't want the Secretary of Commerce, which has nothing to do, 
if you can't have RFC, so they merged the two of them. Wallace, when he gets passed over to be vice president on the next, on the last, Roosevelt's last election, says, gets a Benny, president, he has, president, you can have any department you want, he goes, I want commerce. He's gonna take it away from this guy. But remember, this guy, the Senate and Congress love him, so he just goes to his friends in the Senate and says, hey, rip RFC out of commerce and give it back to me. So Wallace gets the Secretary of Commerce at the end of the war. He gets the RFC. Wallace has absolutely nothing to do with Secretary of Commerce. It's, it's, it's one of the most dirty political fights during the war, um, but hugely meaningless. Did well in the newspapers, and uh, you know when your vice president is literally fist fighting with a, with a cabinet member, that just gets, the, gets in the press. Uh, all right, so. We got what Jesse did. Eventually, Knudsen gets fired. He, he learns he's been fired when his lawyer comes out with a piece of ticker take out of his office and says, hey, the president just fired you. Um, pretty much the 1941 equivalent <coughs> of being fired by tweet, I guess. Uh, <laughs> he's replaced by Donald Nelson. I don't know how to say this about Donald Nelson. He's a Sears Roebuck executive. He believes in managing by consensus. Let's everyone get together and be nice. Well, this is Washington, D.C. That's, that, there's a word for people who manage by consensus in Washington, D.C., even in 1941. It's called roadkill. <sighs> he was seen as weak, which is why Hopkins wanted him to have the job, because he was malleable to Hopkins' ideas. He's very well organized, but he won't fight the big, the big fights and the hard fights, and soon the sharks are circling. And the number one guy circling is, well, I should say number one and two. Brian Somerville is in charge of all Army logistics during the war. And Robert Patterson, the undersecretary of the war. <laughs> all right. They never stopped fighting Donald Nelson. We're going to meet another guy in a minute, uh, Robert Nathan, forgotten mostly by history, but Robert Nathan said the relationship was such that Secretary uh, Somerville would walk in, see Nelson, stab him in the back. Nelson would reach back, take the knife out, hand it to, I believe this is yours. He goes, well, thank you, Donald, it is, and then stab him again. Uh, <laughs> Nelson just wasn't ready for the kind of fight that Somerville could bring. Remember, Somerville's a general. Donald Nelson has complete control of the economy and then hands it back to the military. So now I don't want it. The military will make the hard decisions. So Somerville starts making decisions. He's been told, and we'll come to this, that he could double military spending. They have to double it. If they want to get into full war, if it double it. So he doubles it, then triples it, then quadruples it, and it becomes unbalanced. And Nelson recognizes this, but he won't go tell him this. But he's fighting them a little bit, so they want him fired. And there's Secretary of War Patterson there. Uh, how do you explain Patterson? I uh, said this to somebody at lunch today. He's a Plattsburgher. That's where, you know, he, he, in World War I, he, raised, he becomes a major in World War I eventually. His troops in World War I idolized him. Um, he said the most proudest moment of his life was when he got into hand-to-hand -to -hand combat with two German soldiers, one an officer, and stabbed them both to death. Throughout his entire life, he wore the belt of the German officer he killed. Whether it went with his suit or not, he wore it. Uh, he also set up a fund for any of his soldiers that were in his unit that ran short of money. After the war, they could just come and take money out of that fund, no questions asked. He never looked at the balance, told his banker, if the balance gets to a certain point, tell me so I can fill it up again. After 10 years, in the Great Depression, he says, no, why am I getting a call from my banker? He calls him and finds out that the pot has increased massively because the soldiers that are doing well continue to put money into it. Um, it never dwindled, and eventually it was all given away to a charity. Um, Always took care of his men. He went to bed every night, stayed up looking at the ceiling, convinced that somewhere, someplace, there was a civilian being coddled, and he needed that stuff for the war effort. Um, he thought Nelson's weakness was slowing down the war, war mobilization. He wanted him fired. This is Patterson I'm talking about. 
and some of they'll fully agree with him. Get this guy out of my way. We got to get going. But some of it. But Hopkins had a protector, Harry Hopkins. Nobody was going to fight Harry Hopkins. As Marshall said, you needed something done. Go see Harry. Harry's the guy who got it done in the White House. And if you need something done in the Senate, who'd you go to? Jimmy Burns. Marshall spent two years in South Carolina supporting with every effort he had the Civilian Conservation Corps. Hopkins did not, did, did not not notice that. He took note of every single general who supported the Civilian Conservation Corps and supported New Deal efforts. Somerville himself was his assistant in New York for the Civilian Conservation Corps. The uh, Arnold, the head of the um, Air Force during the war, made a big point of making sure everyone knew he supported the Civilian Conservation Corps. But in South Carolina, Jesse Burns is a senator. And who does Marshall spend his time with on weekends? Jimmy Burns. So when he needs something in the White House, he goes to Harry. When he needs something from the Senate, he goes to Jimmy Burns. They're all pals. They're shooting and hunting buddies. This idea that Marshall was the great general who never, had no ambition because you know, he, did, he turned down the Normandy invasion is a myth. I mean, for his entire career, he is angling for promotion just like almost everybody else. You don't become the chief of staff of the Army if you're not ambitious. And the reason he told the president, we could argue later, uh, the reason he told the president, I'm not, you know, you make your own choices, he was absolutely sure the president was going to choose him. So sure, in fact, his wife had already packed out their furniture to leave the, his home at Fort McNair. Um, another story altogether. Uh, they want him gone. So this is a big fight. It's brewing to get rid of, get rid of uh, the head of the production bureau, to tell the production bureaus, you just have to follow orders from the Army. The production people are telling the Army, they're making these gigantic orders. You are wrecking everything. You are on balance in the production. You have to ask for the optimal amount, not one thing more, not one thing less. And this fight goes on all after Pearl Harbor, and, the, and uh, the military isn't giving it all. So I'm going to introduce you to our three heroes. Anyone ever heard of any of these guys? Simon Kuznets later won the Nobel Prize in economics for something totally different. Stacy May and Robert Nathan. Robert Kuznets is an economist. Stacy May is a statistician slash economist with the Rockefeller Center. And Robert Nathan at the time was a young statistics mathematical genius. His firm, Nathan Associates, is still a major power broker in DC. I went to his house. He married a young wife later in life and I went in his papers and I found them in his basement all waterlogged from flooding. Uh, it was a real loss to me in history. Um, Stacy May is interesting. He's a pacifist. Later becomes an all-outer. His kids asked him about it after the war, why'd you change, you know, you're a pacifist. Why, why, why did you change your mind? He said, well, I was wrong. Uh, <laughs> I was talking to his kids when I was in the book and said, any great memories I could put in here? And I, don't, I don't think I put it in the book because it was a boring book. And the, the, uh, somebody said, uh, one of his daughters said, you know, he, 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 he liked this guy who was a poet. And this poet used to come over all the time and bring a couple of his poet stu poetic students with him. And they'd sit there reciting poetry back and forth to each other. My father worked at his desk and drove my mother crazy. This is the Great Depression. Food is, money is short, and these people are eating them out of house and home. And she kept saying, get this guy out of here. Don't bring him over here anymore. He goes, no, no, he's a good poet. And I said, you wouldn't happen to remember the poet's name, would you? She goes, yeah, Robert Frost. <laughs> <laughs> if you go back and read Robert Frost's poet, poem, The Inchworm, about a bureaucrat who just inches forward every day, it was based on Stacey May. Anyway, these guys came up with GMP and gross domestic product. We never had those statistics until the Great Depression. They figured them out <clears throat> because Congress needed to know these numbers so that they could do to pressure relief. Where are we getting rich? Where are we poor? Where are things bad? Where are things getting better? Their books, their things, tables, they understood American industry better than anyone in the world. Stacey May puts together what's called the Consolidated Balance Sheet. His, it's, when it's finished, it's this big, weighs 35 pounds, and it lists all the industry in America, how fast it can grow, it lists everything you need for a two million man army. Someone says, what if it's a four million man army? He's double it, you know? <laughs> it's very simple. 
He goes to England, does the exact same thing for them, and he comes back unescorted. He gets to Boston finally. He says, I'm, I'm coming back to Washington. And it's like, well, who's taking you? He goes, no, I'm, I'm just going to drive myself down. He goes, no, stay where you are. Later that day, 20 FBI agents show up. We'll take you. He's got the most important document in the world. He's got the entire production capacity of the United States, how fast it can grow, how it can grow, what they can build, everything. So all of you who think Wiedemeyer did this, get, your, get that out of your mind. Wiedemeyer had nothing to do with the Victory Program, nothing. Stacey May created it. He delivered it on December 4th, 1941, to the White House. In it, he predicted what the United States could build for a major war effort with all out production by June of 1944. He was off by 1%. 1%. And he told them, if you want to re-enter the continent of Europe, you won't be able to do it until you reach this production level. So Stacy May, that little mathematician who listened to Robert Frost's poetry in December of 41, predicted that the invasion could not take place before June, and he predicted our entire production effort, just based on his statistics. Well, he's the one who figured it out using Kuznets and Nathan's work. But he's a bit mousy. What's his name? Back a slide. Donald Nelson is weak. They've got to fight this out because they're asking for more than the system can produce. It turns into this gigantic argument, and they, these guys are losing. They're just a bunch of pencil pushers. They write a great report, and he puts on it, Somerville, keep this away from all thoughtful men, which sends them into a tizzy. You're an idiot. You don't understand. And they can't get anyone to fight for them. <laughs> And they're losing. Enter Leon Henderson. Doesn't that guy look like Al Capone? <laughs> I don't know how to describe Leon Henderson. I called his two kids. They both hung the phone up on me. They won't talk about their dad. They hated him. OK? <laughs> one's a very successful surgeon in California. One's a successful surgeon in New Jersey. Um, he's a dollar a year man. But he's a real dollar a year man. He's rich, gets richer when they fire him. Um, he loves to fight. As somebody said at the time, he's got extra fingers so he can stick them into more people's pies. Uh, he is the most hated man in America by far. Industry hates him, people hates him, because his job is to hold back inflation. You can't raise money. You can't raise prices, or I'll do terrible things to you. You can't get pay raises or I'll do terrible things to you. So both sides hate him. He relishes this. This is great. On a hot summer day, he loved to work. He was always in his office. But you had to knock on his door if you were his female secretary because he would be working in his underwear or nude, depending on how hot it was. <laughs> and that's not a body you want to walk in on by accident. <laughs> and since nobody said... You all want to talk. That's a big plus for all of you. <laughs> um, he comes in. He is convinced of the numbers. He's a very good mathematician. And he comes in to the uh, October 13th, 1942 meeting. Somerville's there. Nathan presents the case for everybody. Nathan's a tough guy. He's a boxer before he became a mathematician. Uh, he's voluble. He's convincing. He knows the numbers. But the military just says, we don't care. We're not listening to you. Henderson comes in and just starts whispering. Then his whispering gets louder. And he starts yelling at Somerville, you're an idiot. You don't understand anything. I mean, a vicious assault that goes on for some people say over half an hour without Somerville being able to talk. And he says, if, we, if you guys can't do this right, we'll get new guys. Got to listen to him. He's been an all-outer for a long time. And he can walk into the White House and FDR will see him no notice. And the army caves finally and cuts back all of its production orders by 40% and extends most of the rest of them into 43, so they're not they demanding them in 42. And the system begins to balance a bit, and there's some other guys that come in to help. Somerville doesn't tell Marshall that he's cut his production orders. Marshall goes to Casablanca thinking he's going to have a certain amount of divisions for 1943, and he's 16 short because of the production cuts, and some of it was afraid to tell him. Does not tell him until after the Casablanca conference. Hey, all those divisions you were counting on to invade England in 43 or late, early 44, they're not going to be here. I have no record of how that meeting went. I know it happened. I know the result. 
I would have loved to have been a fly on that when he finally broke the news. Anyway, the army's not get quite ready to give up. There's still a weakling in there. They get rid of these three guys, our heroes. Their whole office is taken out by the military. Kuznets goes back to New York, starts doing pure economics, teaches at Columbia, gets the Nobel Prize. Stacey May goes back to the Rockefeller Center and works on population numbers for a long time. Robert Nathan with Leon Henderson's lawyer, Ginsburg, joins the army because the Washington Post published an article, your boys are fighting and these two Jews are sitting at home making, giving them directions. It was a very highly insulting, very anti-Semitic article. So they said, well, we'll, just, we'll, we'll stop doing this. We've, we've shot our ball. They both enlisted. Uh, they, get to, they get to the South Carolina camp for their training. There's a big thing on the bulletin board at the front gate. These two Jews arrived today with, a po with the article posted up there. They were immediately put on latrine duty, cleaning the latrines throughout the entire post. And Ginsburg looks at Nathan and says, you know, the Army's not treating us very well. And Nathan looks back and says, well, we're getting treated better than we were in DC. <laughs> Ginsburg becomes an engineer major eventually. Nathan gets uh, hurt and um, mustered out of the Army. I think he made major and he gets mustered out before the war's over where he became a power broker in D.C. for the next 50 years. Uh, Leon wins the big fight. But remember, he's always the most hated man in America, so the president has to get rid of him. And uh, Somerville gets promoted. Now, I don't want to say Somerville is a, is a fool. Somerville is a brilliant man who did a tremendous amount of work supplying two theaters of war throughout the entire war. No, but he was the right man, the right place, the right job. He just got this wrong. And eventually he caved and, he, and, and gets it right. So here's Ferdinand Eberstadt, another forgotten man. They got the orders right, but they still didn't have the priorities right. The War Production Board had a list of, I think, 15,000 items that had to be accounted for by all of the factories. Staffs in the thousands, a lot, and your factory gets this, your factory gets this. And it was a nightmare. It was chaos. They bring Eberston in. The Secretary of War, Harry Stipson, says, I know the guy who could fix this. They bring him in. And they bring in another guy, Charlie Wilson, who they bo both hate each other, but they both hate Donald Nelson even more. So they both want to be in charge, and the Army is back in this guy. And um, he figures out the whole production thing. He says, why are we tracking 15,000 items? Just tell the prime contractors we're tracking copper, steel, and iron, uh, copper, steel, and coal from now on, and everything else will fall into place as if by magic. And he was right. Suddenly, all the things we were tracking became useless. We'll just track these three items, and the, we'll give them to the prime contractors, and they can release them to the subcontractors, and the system will work. Sort of, sort of like capitalism instead of a command control economy. And we were going command and control. We were full out Russians without a Russian Soviet, an acquiescent Soviet population until Ferdinand came in and said, no, we'll make this easy. The capitals will figure it out. Let them do it. The army loves it because now the supplies are rolling. We got this guy, Charlie Wilson. First, I have to destroy Eberstadt. So Eberstadt figures out the priorities this guy is a production genius. He is a railroad man. He's a brawler. He likes to fight, literally fist fight. He would get sent to his office one day, and someone said, you know, I beat you up 25 years ago. And he said, you must be whatever the guy's name was. He goes, how'd you remember my name? You're the only guy who ever beat me up. <laughs> um, he doesn't look like a tough guy, but he was. Um, so Eberstadt figured out the priorities. Wilson figured out the scheduling. After this, production's on automatic. It's, they've got it figured out. It's only who's going to be in charge. He's trying to make, um, Eberstadt is actually trying to make Nelson a figurehead. And the military says, this is our chance. They go to the president, and it looks like Nelson's about to be fired. Eberstadt's going to get it. Well, even being a weak man, he has a sense for self-preservation, so he fires Eberstadt. And the president can't reverse it. He'll look foolish. 
So Eberstadt's gone, and now it's just the president and Charlie Wilson. Well, Charlie Wilson doesn't fight Nelson. He just stops talking to him. He makes all the decisions. He fires anybody who goes to Nelson to, get a, to go over his head. And Nelson has no idea, because Charlie Wilson is a nice guy, coming in, telling him about what's going on, what a great job he's doing. And slowly but surely, takes over everything. Well, who can't stand that? Harry Hopkins, a powerful man that's you know, now running production, I've got to have it. I'm going to get rid of Charlie Wilson and bring back Bernard Baruch. He goes to the president and says, this is the guy that's got to run it. Let's bring him in. And the president acquiesces. He's always a little leery about Baruch because Baruch is a power center onto himself, and, that, and, Will, and the Roosevelt can't have that. But he says yes, and then <laughs> Baruch makes the mistake of a lifetime and says, let me think about it for a week. Well, a week is all Harry Hopkins needs to destroy that uh, thing. And he goes to Jimmy Burns and says, you should do it. You should be in charge. And he thinks he can control Jimmy Burns because they get along. They're very personable. So Jimmy Burns comes back. This is it. Hopkins is losing power. He's out of the White House now. Baruch has made the mistake of waiting. When he comes back to, to take the job, it's not there for him anymore. Jones is in his fight with... Uh, Wallace, as long as he's got the money being spent, he's fine. Wilson will be pushed aside if Burns is in charge. Morgenthau has become a non-entity. We got all the money we need now. Let's, you know, he's not, we don't need him. Everybody's in. Henderson gets fired. Those three guys at the end have all gone back to New York. Centers are into the army. And there's Jimmy Burns. <laughs> I win. <laughs> Harry Hopkins, can I use a bad word? If anybody is against a word that begins with F, please raise your hand. OK, I will, you will. OK, you're against it. We will use another word. We will use the word frack. <laughs> you know Marilyn Monroe when she met uh, Norman Mailer, I think? He had the book on the war that had the word that began with an F over and over again, but the editor wouldn't let him put it in. And uh, so he wrote frack instead throughout the book. And she met him the first time. And she goes, oh, you're the. You're the author that doesn't know how to spell. <laughs> you can use that at parties. You don't even have to credit me. Anyway, as his first stop to make sure Burns knows who's the real power, Burns' first job is he moves into the White House. He puts his office right in the White House. And he starts calling himself the assistant president. Roosevelt doesn't like that, but he, he won't stop. He just keeps doing it. Everyone in the Senate loves Jimmy Burns, so he gets along with the Senate. Everybody in the ward loves him because him and Marshall are best friends. Him and Arnold are good friends. So there's no problem there. There's nobody who hates Jimmy Burns enough to, to fight him that has anywhere near a chance. Uh, and he's brutal against his enemies. So you know he smiles a lot. You don't see him smiling in this picture, but he's a friendly guy. He also hates labor. He's a racist and a whole bunch of other things. But besides that, He's, you know, he's a good guy to have a beer with. Uh, he tells the president, don't fire Nelson. Give him another job. Send him, to, send him to China and have him do a big report for you. Nelson's like, president calls me, hey, I got a big job for you. And suddenly Nelson's off to China. Never knew what hit him. <laughs> Burns doesn't even set up an office, a big office. He says, look, don't get involved in their fights. I want a small office. We're here to make decisions when they can't. If you get involved in their operational matters, you'll become part of the problem. So he's a very small office, and he just solves problems by making a decision. And there's no appeal except the president. And the president wants to leave it in Jimmy Burns' hands. So, but Harry Hopkins doesn't like this. this is, I, he always thought of himself as the assistant president, though he would never use those words. And he goes down to Jimmy Burns' office, Close the door. He goes, let me explain to you how things work here. You know, he's going to give him the whole power setting. He's going to tell him who's in charge. She burns. Goes, Thank you, Harry. I'd love to hear this. Go ahead. 45 minutes, Harry goes on. Burns doesn't say a word. It's all, well, do you understand that, Harry? I, I got you a picture, yeah? He goes, anything you want to say? Any comments? Oh, yeah, I do have one comment now you mention it, Harry. He goes, well, what's that? From this point on, stay the frack out of my business. <laughs> That's how power changes in Washington, D.C. Burns was absolutely sure he was going to be the next president of the United States, next vice president. 
The convention people came to talk to the president, the, the head of the Democratic Party. As the head of the Democratic Party, I forget his name, he was also uh, mayor of New York. Not, well, no, he was, no, not New York. I forget his name. Uh, anyway, came in, he said he took one look at the president and knew they were not picking the president, the vice president, they were there to pick a pre the next president, that he wasn't going to live for the thing. And they looked at who the president wanted, said, no, you can't have Wallace, you can't have it, you can't have this, you have to have this guy. The president promised the job to Burns once Wallace fell out, but the party said he can't get elected, he, he can't get the black vote because he's a known racist, South Carolina senator, can't get the labor vote, he'll cost us New York. Um, this, this, this could give the Republicans the election. But Jimmy Burns goes to the convention believing he is going to be the vice presidential nominee, and he's asked Harry Truman to announce him. And Harry says, fine. Harry doesn't find out to the day, that day, first day of the convention, that the president has picked him and um, comes, up to, you know, comes up to him and goes, do you mind if I don't introduce you? The president wants me. Burns flies into a rage goes back to his office where his secretary said he started throwing the furniture around, and then he called back to Truman, no, no, you, I'll be happy to have you as the vice president of the United States, and calmed himself down. And that's how we got to President Truman. <laughs> and that's it. Oh, wait, I got one more. Bought a book. This is, I, love this, I love this picture because of all the people that are Stalin didn't show up. This is the Quebec conference. Who's that? Alan Brook. Alan Brook is the head of the British military. That's Arnold saying that. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jim. Talk about the research you did. Where did you get your information <laughs> about the conversation? Because that's what everyone wants to know. <laughs> um, for, there's a lot of stuff. I don't talk. I, today I talk to the civilian side because that's what most people don't write about. I gave this book to guys that have been here. So you've had Stoller, I guess, at some point. Um, Allies and Adversaries, Rob Satino. I gave this book to six of the top World War II historians. And they were like, wow, I didn't know any of this. So I was real happy about that. They said, you could drop the last fair to the book, because that's why I start talking about the war and the conferences and stuff like that. They said, well, that's because you know it. Most Americans have no idea what went on in these conferences. So I left it. Though it was 270,000 words. It's now 170,000. If you want the full draft, you send me proof of purchase, and I'll send you the PDF. <laughs> uh, how I did the research. <sighs> I went to the archives because I saw someplace that there was an official history of the Joint Staff that never got published. There's one, the, fish, the, the Joint Staff in the Pacific War that's out there, and there was one in the European War. And it, I called the history office of the Joint Staff. They said, I didn't, we don't have it. We lost it 30, 30 to 50 years ago. We've been looking for it. So I went to the National Archives. So where would I hide if I was a Joint History? And I asked for the bo this box. I opened the box, and there it was. It was like a miracle. God wanted me to have this for some reason. And so I got an official history of the Joint Staff written by a colonel that was on the Joint Staff the entire war that no one's ever seen before. And that was big. A lot of this stuff is known if you look at the, you know, if you go to Burns' autobiography, which no one reads, you'd see some of this stuff. So a lot of it is just collecting out of places you're just not going to read or see unless you are dedicated to that one person and stuff. And then the uh, Stimson Diaries, Every day of the war, Stimson went home from the day he became the Secretary of War until the end of the war and dictated into a dictaphone all of his thoughts for that day and um, had his secretary type it up. So every day of the of the day, and he doesn't pull any punches. And uh, I went to Carlisle where they had these on microfilm, and they had three special machines there. I gave myself two weeks to read through them. Uh, and they had machines that turned the page of the microfilm and then to put it into a thumb drive. And six hours later, I left with the entire steps and diagrams and laid, loaded them onto my computer. And every day of the war that I'm writing about, I could go and see what the Secretary of War was thinking. Um, and the stuff, people quote the Stimson diaries all the time. But they're quoting the book he wrote based on his diaries with George Bundy. He changed things. 
There's a whole bunch of historians taking credit for going to Yale and reading his diaries, but they're actually copying it out of the book. And when you have the actual diaries in front of you, you're like, that's not what he really said. Um, so there's a lot of that. A lot of the Marshall papers became available. Um, you know, I hit it at the right time. Some of this became easy. The Morgenthau diaries were put online. That was massive. No one could read the Morgenthau diaries. They would fill this entire room. He saved every piece of paper. But some idiot, not idiot, some brilliant person, they paid a lot of money, indexed the entire thing. And they came online, like literally the day I started researching this book. So I had the Morgenthau diaries, which have been unreadable to everybody since forever, plus an index that allowed me to do things that no one else has ever done. So you're going to see stuff in here that just doesn't popped up in other books because, one, they didn't know where it was. Two historians are lazy, and I'm lazy too, but I decided to make an effort on this one. Uh, <laughs> and we'll see if it Question pays here. off. Which of those guys uh, ma uh, managed the Manhattan Project, and how did that come okay. together to be so successful? None of them. So there's other things that are going on in Washington, but this is the Washington War, where the fights and the debates were. Nobody thought about, there was no fighting going on about the Manhattan Project because none of them knew about it. Truman and his Truman Committee stumbled on it. Like he says he did not know about it until after he became president and they briefed it. The Truman Committee found it. And Stimson has in his diaries where he called him and said, do not make a point of this, do not do anything. Someone will come by and brief you. And the Stim and and Truman says, no, your word is enough. I don't need to be briefed. But they found it. So the reason it's not in the book is there was no argument or debate over it during the entire war. It was just running on automatic. Marshall got the money into the budget. Well, not Marshall. Marshall said we need it. Burns put it into the congressional budget. And there was no discussion. And that was it. it was so black box. it was a totally black box. And they put General Groves in charge of it. He turned out to be an administrative genius, and that's it. Question here. Yes. Do you know where Lindbergh is from? Go ahead. Tell me St. Paul. <laughs> <laughs> the Lindbergh house is in... Uh... Look, he's a hero. He just misused his hero. His hero some of the, he, after this, he tries to come into the military, and Stimson is so mad at him, he won't let him in. He has to sneak off to the Pacific where he does some very good stuff. He runs a few combat missions. He actually works with the planes and comes up with a way where they can f fly something in the area 40% fervor on the same amount of fuel, which makes it possible in the South Pacific to hit bases that were out of range. He does a lot of great stuff to help the war effort. Arnold knows he's there and doesn't tell Stimson, but when Stimson finds out, he orders him back and puts him back in civilian life. So once the war starts, he finds his patriotism, becomes a great American, and did a lot of stuff to help the war effort. So just be, if you could, if you could overlook his being an early, a early supporter of Hitler and trying to keep us out of the war, he tried to, he tried to make it right. Uh, during the early part of this industrial mobilization, right. uh, was the public made aware of it? And if so, what were they told? I mean, they... I mean, you're... You've got all these factories going up. What are they being told? Oh, they could see it. No, by, by, by when this finally, when mobilization finally kicks off, it's 1941. Um, that's when most of the factories are going up. That's when the conversion is happening and all the factories are being ripped apart to, put, to switch to the war effort. That really does not kick into gear until 41. Congress approves the money in June, July, August of 40, where they put the, Pentagon asked for 600 million, the White House asked for 2 billion, and the Congress gave them 16 billion. And they didn't have any idea how to spend it. So like a famous quote I like from before World War I where Churchill was in Congress and he said, the, the Admiralty demanded six ships, the Parliament said they could have no more than four, and we compromised on eight. <laughs> uh, so it kicks off. The, the, the collapse of France so quickly in 1940 caught everybody's attention, and they knew they had to rearm. So the money gets approved in J June, July, August. It gets reapproved, more money in December, and then the production just takes off in early 41. Question here. You didn't mention Knox or Admiral King. Were they involved in any of these fights? They're in the book. Uh, <laughs> I only had 45 minutes. Um, 
It's not out Knox yet. Is not, Knox, is, Knox doesn't get into the industrial fights because Congress approves the naval budget in 1938, and it's by law. So he doesn't have to fight for anything. I mean, the carriers that come into the fleet in 43 and 44, their keels are laid down in 38, 39, and 40. So he doesn't care about that fight. His biggest fight is with King himself. Calls a meeting, King just says, I'm not coming. Knox sends a note to his office, to, you know, Admiral, I'm ordering your ships to move, and King never missed a meeting after that. Um, the, the big arguments is the, is the War Department. They're the ones that have the biggest budget. The Navy budget's already locked in by law. It can't be touched. So Knox doesn't have that fight. Um, King is a power onto himself, as we, anyone who's read anything or knows anything about King. I have my own opinion. I wouldn't like to work for the guy, but <laughs> he is exactly what the Navy needed in the year after Pearl Harbor. But he may have been a little too much by 44. And uh, yeah, get on. Sir. Uh, this may be going a bit beyond uh, what you're talking about. But I'm, you know, the impression I have is this was a fantastically effective effort to get uh, America militarily ready. How does it compare to what the other side was doing? Uh, how were the Germans and the Japanese uh, you know, mobilizing and waging a war? I mean, I, don't, I, don't, I couldn't answer that question at the time allotted to me to this evening, unless we're all going to be here till midnight. I'm going to recommend some books. As you want to, you want to know everything there is to know about the German production and the war economy, get Adam Tooze's book, Wages of Destruction. It's a brilliant book. I don't know that there's a great study on the Japanese war production yet. Uh, but you got to remember, Japan is taking on a country literally 21 times its industrial might. Germany doesn't start full war production until 1944. Um, so they're on a blitzkrieg economy, short wars. I mean, he starts demobilizing after France. So there's a, um, they don't get it. They also don't understand production. You know, the Americans are in a mass production mode and the Germans are still craftsmen. And I have to find where I read this. I read it years ago. They took a colonel that had been shot down out to an American plane that had been shot down. They had industrialist uh, designers looking at it, and they were making fun of the American plane, saying, look, it's got poor craftsmanship. This, this is jagged. It sticks out. And he goes, German planes are built so much better than this. And he goes, in the time we've been talking here, America's built 40 of those. And that caught all the time. Oh, that's right. Um, and we were doing, uh, if you want to see how the production was hit, there's a great book out there, How the Allies Won the War by Pace and O'Brien. He's got a new book coming out about Leahy. I'm dying to see it because I just researched Leahy hard and he's a cipher. I can't find anything to write about the guy. Enough to put a couple of chapters in, but not enough to write a book. Um, he shows how the production, the Germans in the month after Kursk produced more tanks than they had lost in the Battle of Kursk. And he explains where they went, why they never got to the front, and all that stuff. So I can't, they were trying, but the United States at the end of World War II had a GDP bigger by triple all the Axis powers combined. No one, no one could compete with the United States. Uh, the guy, Monet, does anyone you know him? He's the founder of the European Union. He was the French purchasing agent to America for the war. France collapses. He flies to England. Before he leaves, he says, everything France has bought, moved to the English account. Goes to Churchill, where he becomes a foreign in his side. He goes, look, you got to get American production. In America, he has a little scale map. He goes, he puts it over England. This is New England. But New England itself has three times the production of what's under here. And then he pulled a map back, and it'd be England. Yeah. America is the production factory. So Churchill, to get him out of the way, sends him to the United States, where he starts he becomes very good friends with Stacey May, you know, the little mathematician guy, and Felix Frankfurter. And he'd write a note from Churchill to the president to have Frankfurter deliver it. Frankfurter would deliver the response. He'd rewrite it and send it back to Churchill. So he was writing letters to himself and signing it with Churchill and Roosevelt's name to get production started. <laughs> These are the things you have to do when, uh, you know, your politicians just aren't moving in the right direction. Um, I don't know where I was going with that, but I just love the story. <laughs> well, listen, I, 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 I'm going to ask the last question. Here, here, Jim. Beep, beep, beep. Here, over here. Over here means nothing to here. me. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to ask the last question. Uh, could you give a, a comparison of the turbulence in 
the, uh, I'm going to use it, the command structure in D.C. that you've described this evening with what's going on in Washington today. <laughs> All right. Uh, when, you re when you look at the fighting in Washington, D.C., it's bad. But I would say it was just as bad in the Great Depression and even worse during the early production period here. The, le the liberals, not liberals, the Democrats and the Republicans were at each other's throats in ways we can barely imagine. Uh, and what they were calling each other, how violent the fighting was, and what, what it was. That all being said, both sides were patriots. And once the war broke out, the fighting continued, but it wasn't, it wasn't, against, it wasn't because of diametrically opposed to each other. It was like, I have a better way to win the war than you. But they were all aiming in the same direction. They were all experimenting. When something made sense, they kept at it. Our problem is we have recessions, but we don't have a Great Depression. We don't have, you know, Afghanistan and Iraq are hard fights, but they're not existential threats to us. I, I, I see, as I look at the political side, we've had much worse political fighting, but in most of those times, it's brought to an end by a major threat that everyone says, this is big, we could still fight, but we could fight politely, and uh, we don't have that now. We didn't have the internet and Twitter at that time, so. Yeah, but newspapers and radios did the job. Did and the job. We, uh, well, so listen, why I am a ultra-right wing conservative, I don't give a darn about social things, and that's where I see most of the fighting happening. And anyway, if at, the rate, at a trillion dollars a year, we will go bankrupt at some point, and then we'll get fixed. Because the day after we go bankrupt, it's only an accounting problem. You know, we still have. Trained, we still have resources, industry, trained population, and because we went bankrupt, our debt is now zero. Eh, it's going to be a sucky five years, but we'll get over it. <laughs> well, listen, uh, just a, a show of hands for the people that are here. Uh, the book is due out, The Washington Wars. Obviously, we've got the, the, the one book uh, that's kind of a preface to his Washington Wars book. We've got that here t tonight. But if any of you would like to have the Washington Wars signed, uh, raise your hand. I'll, we'll, we'll get them, and it'll, it'll be at the September program. Okay. Jim, thank you for coming in, and uh, come up and say hi to him, folks. Thank you. Support for this program provided by viewers like you. Thank you. Additional support provided through the Catherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation. Upcoming roundtable topics can be found at www.mn-ww2roundtable.org. Production services provided by Barrows Productions.